Martin Luther imagined that his critiques of the Roman Catholic Church were so obvious and so righteous that people would rush to his Reformed theology and create a rival and true competitor to the Catholic Church. He even thought it possible that more Catholic clergy would join him and that the Reformed Church would become bigger and better than the Catholic Church. As it turns out, Luther was very wrong. Instead, almost from the beginning, fractures formed between those espousing the Reformed faith. While Lutheranism was the most widely adopted of the Reformed faiths, in fact, by 1527, the Kingdom of Sweden had adopted Luther's Reformed theology as their state religion, other Reformers were preaching different beliefs. In 1522, a Swiss priest just over a year older than Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, began publicly challenging the Catholic Church. Over the course of the 15-teens, Zwingli had become convinced that the Church had abandoned the doctrines and practices of the early Church Fathers. Luther's writings only reiterated Zwingli's personal convictions. At about the same time that Luther began to challenge the doctrines of the Church, Zwingli, too, began protesting church doctrines and practices, such as the clergy's ability to marry and the use of statues and images in places of worship. Swiss reformers, led by Zwingli, instituted a series of public debates over the issue of church reform. By 1525, the same year that the German Peasants' Revolt ended, several Swiss cantons states had abolished the Mass and refuted a number of other church practices. Importantly, the Swiss reformers tended toward biblical literalism, the belief that the words of the Bible should all be taken literally. This belief in literalism ran counter to the teachings of the Catholic Church and to those of Luther's movement. For Catholics and Lutherans, much of the Bible was presented as allegory and had to be interpreted. For this and other reasons, Zwingli refused to associate himself with Luther's movement, insisting that, while he'd read Luther, he set out his own doctrine. This disunity within the reformers' camp made politicians sympathetic to reform nervous. They preferred to have a unified front. So, they pressured the two great leaders of reform movements, Luther and Zwingli, to attempt a compromise. In October of 1529, Luther, Zwingli, and their closest advisors met in Marburg for a meeting now known as the Marburg Colloquy. The two men were able to agree on a number of things, mostly dealing with elements of public worship and sacraments. However, there was a marked disagreement about the meaning and purpose of communion. This disagreement was referred to as the sacramentarian controversy. Now, like Luther, Zwingli disagreed with the Catholic teaching on transubstantiation during communion. In fact, between 1524 and 1527, Zwingli had written a series of tracts which argued that during the Last Supper, when Jesus said, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body, the is meant signifies. Thus, Jesus was not saying that the bread was literally his body, but that it signified his body. By extension, Zwingli thus argued that the celebration of communion in Reformed liturgy was the commemoration of the Last Supper, a symbolic memory of Christ's last meal on earth. Luther had already, back in 1527, written a response to Zwingli's ideas about communion. In that response, Luther had outlined his belief that the verb is should be taken literally, that Jesus was saying that the bread was his body. Luther explained, however, that the bread, or wine, did not become Christ's body and blood, but rather that Christ's real presence existed in sacramental union with bread and wine, just like it does with everything else that God created. Luther then argued that the celebration of communion contained the real presence of Christ and was more than just a commemoration or a symbolic memory. Although the two groups made light of this argument, the resulting Marburg articles indicated that they agreed on 14 out of 15 principles, the sacramentarian controversy indicated the first real doctrinal split between the first two organized Protestant groups. Zwingli returned to Switzerland, somewhat happy to leave Germany and Northern Europe to the Lutherans. He had bigger problems in Switzerland, the rise of more radical reformers. In 1525, a group of Zwingli's followers had broken away and formed a separate group called the Swiss Brethren. They broke away from Zwingli's group because they felt reforms weren't happening fast enough 
and because they disagreed with Zwingli on the sacrament of baptism. They argued that since infant baptism was never mentioned in the Bible, it should not be allowed. The brethren believed that only adults could possibly understand the concept of baptism, and so only adults should be baptized. Thus, the brethren were Anabaptists, or rebaptizers part of a group of radical reformers who practiced adult baptism. Anabaptist groups like the Swiss Brethren, this would include the Amish and the Mennonites, also believed that they should not swear oaths to anyone but God, that they should not use civil courts to resolve matters, and that they should not bear arms or hold civil office. Basically, they believed they should largely withdraw from the secular world in order to focus on God. Their willingness to withdraw from society, which affected, say, relationships within the manorial and feudal systems, caused significant upheaval. Zwingli saw no problem with stamping out Anabaptism, which he saw as a perversion of Christianity, using violent means. These attacks, however, sparked violence between Zwingli's reformers and other Swiss Christians. While neither the Catholic nor Lutherans of Switzerland liked the Anabaptists, they decided to join together in 1531 to put an end to Zwingli's violence against them. Zwingli was killed at the Battle of Koppel that year. Both Catholics and Lutherans claimed that Zwingli's death was a divine judgment against his religious positions. The end result of Zwingli's efforts was the establishment of the Swiss Reformed Church in northern Switzerland and the introduction of biblical literalism to the Protestant Reformation. Switzerland fractured religiously, with Zwinglian and Lutheran Reformed cantons in the north and the Catholic cantons in the south. Anabaptist groups in other parts of Europe didn't fare much better. Most civil authorities believed that a third baptism, that is, execution by drowning, was, quote, the best antidote to Anabaptism. Some Anabaptists withdrew to remote locations in Central Europe, to places deep in the Black Forest of Central Europe. But many, instead, chose to immigrate to the European colonies of North America in the later 16th and 17th centuries, mostly settling in what is now Ohio and Pennsylvania. Luther and Zwingli, and figures like Thomas Munzer of the Peasants' Revolt, were Protestant leaders of the first generation, those who led movements in the first decades of separation from the Catholic Church. The most significant second-generation Protestant reformer was John Calvin, Born just eight years before Luther published his 95 Theses, Calvin studied theology and law at the University of Paris. There, he was exposed to Christian humanism and began to advocate for some reforms within the church. In the early 1530s, with Paris becoming less tolerant of Protestant reformers, Calvin went to Basel in northern Switzerland. This city had already adopted the reformed theology. While there, Calvin read widely and he began working on his own version of Christianity, which borrowed from both Luther and Zwingli, among other reformers. Calvin published his Institutes of the Christian Religion in 1536. This is a text which would become incredibly important for later Protestant denominations, particularly those we refer to as evangelical. Calvin's Institutes heavily borrowed from Luther's treatises and Luther's understanding of the sacraments, but Calvin also set forth the Zwinglian adherence to biblical literalism. This meant that he viewed the sacrament of communion not as Luther had, but rather the way Zwingli had, as a commemoration of the Last Supper. Unsurprisingly, the Institutes heavily criticized Catholic doctrines. But this text went further than Luther did in all his writings. Calvin set forth his plan for a perfect religious state, in which the role of the church and civil authorities would be closely intertwined to ensure adherence to Christian morality. One doctrine that Calvin introduced to the Protestant Reformation is that of predestination. This is the belief that, in Calvin's own words, all events whatsoever are governed by the secret counsel of God. Calvin applied this concept not only to events that occur in the world, but also to the concept of salvation. He taught that not only does God decide who attains salvation, who goes to heaven, but that God also decides who is damned to hell. It was, of course, impossible to know if a Christian was already a member of the elect, if they were already saved. 
However, Calvin believed that the elect were granted earthly blessings, material wealth, healthy families, political and spiritual influence. Conversely, those who were already damned were likely not so blessed. They might struggle in business or struggle to have or raise a family or regularly engage in criminal activity due to poor moral character. Calvin's ideas of Christianity, and particularly his desire to essentially establish a theocracy, led the people of Basel to turn against him. In the late 1530s, Calvin would continue his teaching and writing in Strasbourg in northeastern France before being invited to Geneva in 1541. There, he worked with the city council to establish the kind of religious government he envisioned as ideal. He did face resistance, but by the early 1550s, he was without doubt the religious authority in Geneva. He founded a school for children, believing that an educated populace was necessary because children needed to be able to read the Bible and the Institutes in order to know what good and moral actions were. Calvin was committed to helping Protestant reformers across all of Europe. He regularly welcomed Protestants fleeing persecution to Geneva. In fact, Calvin mentored one such exile, Scotsman John Knox, in the 1550s. Knox embraced Calvinism, and when he returned to Scotland in 1559, Knox founded a Scottish Calvinist church known as the Presbyterian Church. As influential as Calvin and his followers became, he himself was especially engaged in supporting Protestants back home in France. Most Protestants in France were Calvinists, but these French Calvinists, known as Huguenots, were a tiny minority of France's Christian population, and they were severely persecuted. Despite his great influence, Calvin was unable to alleviate the suffering of his followers in France during his lifetime. John Calvin died in 1564 at the age of 54. Martin Luther, who'd started the Protestant Reformation, had died nearly 20 years prior in 1546 at the age of 62. By the time of Calvin's death, Reformation ideas had spread throughout Europe and indeed were spreading throughout the world. Europe's age of exploration meant that the Reformation arrived in the Americas and in Asia almost as soon as it had emerged in Europe itself. If this change had just been religious, perhaps this would be the end of the story. But of course, it wasn't. And there's so much more of the story left to tell.